I told you. I told you. Every now and then I know what I'm talking about. And as we recap, the North Carolina Central victory over North Carolina a and you'll see how our keys to victory dictated the outcome. Oh, yeah. It's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. going on family welcome back to another episode of the locked on hbcu podcast your number one daily one-stop shop for everything hbcu athletics monday through friday part of the locked on podcast network your team every day and i of course am darian gray aka the mouth of the south texas southern alum and former tsu herald sports editor and current contributing writer at usa today's saints wire and I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day, every single day going on this journey with me. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. Just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S, ends with an S. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment more. And right now, if you are a new customer, when you only bet $5, you get 200 back in bonus bets. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to take advantage. And we have a variety pack. We're going through so many conferences, so many teams. Let's take a stop in the CIAA and let's look at Dante Lee Jr., who has all of the makings of an elite level deep ball threat for Shaw. But before that, we're going to go to the SWAC. Because down there in Alabama State, this is the problem that I have with the Hornets. It was that way last year. And so far through 2023, it's that way yet again. But before we do any of that, let's go ahead and take a trip out to North Carolina. We have a little CAA business, a little MEAC business, and really just a little a rivalry that I kind of feel like I should pat myself on the back for. I like to pat myself on the back. You actually hear me say this week that I was wrong about something. But as we kick off the week, I'm going to discuss something I feel a little bit of pride in. And that's the fact that our keys to victory that we came up with on Friday truly, truly did tell the story of the outcome of North Carolina A&T versus North Carolina Central. So first off, let's remind everybody, all my everyday is exactly what it was. It was basically along the same lines. So you had North Carolina Central, who I said, stop the run. That is your key to victory. North Carolina a and wants to do it to you. That's what they want to do. Stop the run. And as far as North Carolina a and goes, it was find a passing game. So they're right there along the same lines, which is why that, that facet of the game is really what decided it to me. So that's one thing we got completely right. North Carolina a and wanted to run the ball. I said it. This was not coach speak. This was not trying to play reverse psychology. They weren't going to come out and be pass heavy. They wanted to run the ball. And when they did it well, they got points. When they didn't, they did not get points. It was just that simple. So let's look at it. There was a couple of drives in which North Carolina a and scored. Two drives, to be specific. On the field goal drive, Kenji Christian had a 27-yard run. Field goal. You look at the touchdown drive. Christian had a 35-yard run, then he had a 15-yard run, and then Wesley Graves capped it off with a 47-yard touchdown run. So when they were able to run the ball well, they scored. That's 10 points of their 16. Actually, I don't remember when they missed an extra point, but that's two of the three scoring plays that they had, a field goal and a 47-yard Wesley Graves touchdown run. The other one was a kickoff return. Didn't have the offense involved in it. So when the offense scored, it was because the running game was able to get rushes of 15 or more yards. They had explosive plays. That didn't happen at any other possession. That 35, 15, 47 yard, that was the, all three of those runs were on the same drive. Outside of either one of these scoring drives, North Carolina a had one drive that was more than 15 yards. 
not just one play, one drive that was more than 15 yards. So when you weren't able to break off these big runs, a t couldn't move the ball. And that's a problem because a ts key to victory was find a passing game, and they were not able to do it. The only time they found success offensively was when Christian and Graves were working their magic on the ground. And listen, I like what Graves and Christian have been able to do, but if you do not pass the ball, you will not be a good offense, simple and plain. When Bashul Tootin was out there and he was setting records for consecutive 100-yard pass or uh, rushing games, when you had a multi-win streak, you're looking at a game that, <clears throat> excuse me, you're looking at a team that had a run game, but then they also had the passing game. The offense, I wouldn't consider the quarterback to be a liability within the offense. He was able to hold his own. So that's the way I look at it. Tootin was the engine, but you had to have other things. And I can look at Graves. I can look at Christian and say, okay, I like what they're doing. They should be the engine. And they put on good running performances. But no matter how good that Christian or Graves have done, it rarely matters. It will rarely matter going forward if you don't find the ability to pass the ball. It's simple and plain. If you are a one-dimensional offense, you likely will not be a good team. Especially if that dimension is running the ball. Sometimes people can pass the way that, like FAMU. FAMU wasn't a great running team last year, but they were able to pass the ball. And a lot of times, that allows your offense to be better. If your one dimension is passing the football you will probably be better than if your one dimension is running the football because you, if you can't pass, you're out of the game at a certain point. South Carolina State, when they were down to Jackson State, I said, this game is over because you cannot pass. You can't come back from anything. Running is great when you're protecting the lead, but when you're trying to come back from a deficit, not so much. So that's the story. Stop North Carolina a ts running game. You weren't able to do it on a couple of drives. They had some big rushes. And on those drives, they scored. But every other drive, you were able to keep this relatively in check. And on all those other drives, they didn't score. That was the key for North Carolina Central. When they executed it, we saw what happened. They come up victorious, only allowing 16 points. And six of those points were off of a kickoff return. You look at North Carolina a t their key to victory was to find a passing game. They have not done it. You have to elevate to be successful. They didn't do it in week two, and they were not successful. It's that simple. And if you were curious on what North Carolina Central did in their running game, you had Davius Richard and Latrell Collier. Both had 17 carries, 95 yards, 5.8 per carry, and two touchdowns. Identical stat sheets when it comes to them running the ball. But this was about our key to victory and how that really did tell the story in the outcome of A&T versus Central. And we'll be watching to see if a t steps up that aspect of their game going forward because I think it's going to be necessary if they're going to want to win some ball games. I really do. I don't like. I don't think it's suggested. I think it's mandatory that they do this. So moving forward, we're going to go on a little road trip. We left North Carolina. We're going to go in down to Alabama. We're heading into SWAT country because I have a big problem with Alabama State. And honestly, I don't even think it's my problem with Alabama State. I think it's the problem with Alabama State. And we're looking at exactly what it is and why it's so severe as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by Athletic Brewing. And much like Ethan Hunt, Ethan Hunt, that's Mission Impossible. Andre Hunt for Jackson State, who I felt stole all of Southern's momentum that they were trying to build to come back against the Tigers. And that was a true game changer. Athletic Brewing is a game changer for the non-alcoholic brews. So when you're looking at their brews, they have been put toe-to-toe with some of the full-strength beers out there. Beat them in competition. They're great tasting, award-winning, right? These are things that you want to remember. And there's no hangovers. They taste delicious and no hangovers. No, oh, man, I feel a little sluggish in the morning. You can drink them at the kids' soccer practice. You can drink them while you're watching Locked On HBCU. If you are, take a picture of your athletic brew and go ahead and take a picture of me at the same time. DM it to me. That'd be dope. Or post it, tag me, whatever. You know how it goes. But, yes, go ahead and go to athleticbrewing.com. Or you can go into some of the stores as well. But if you're online, first-time customers get a 15% off discount using the code locked on L O C K E D O N near beer exclusions, conditions 
do apply athletic brewing company fit for all times. As we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day. Every day, make sure you're checking out College Football Live. Every single Friday, we have our College Football Kickoff Live from the host around the nation, including yours truly, to break down the biggest matchups of the upcoming week, some of the robberies, and then also some of the things that happened in the week prior. So don't want to miss any of that. That's from 10 a.m., to noon central time Friday live on locked on HBCU. Now I have an issue and I think that not only is this my issue, this is the issue when it comes to Alabama state. We came on here last week and we discussed Alabama state's victory over Southern because transparently, Hey, that was one of the three biggest games going into week one. In my opinion, it truly was. It was Florida A&M versus Jackson state. I had TSU versus PV and I had Alabama State versus Southern with the second and third ones really being interchangeable. So, of course, we were going to discuss this. And I brought Nate, uh, Mason Smith on the show. We discussed that. What I'm about to say, and y'all, keep me honest. I want you to keep me honest. If I'm doing a full 180 right now and it feels like I'm just retracting real quick, let me know. And we'll have a, you know, a conversation about it. I don't feel that that's the case. But I will tell you one thing that I do think I was a little bit a um, little bit guilty of. I didn't express my concern enough. I had a little bit of pushback. I, I, I wasn't ready really to crown Alabama State quite yet in that offense. And, man, I, I probably should have looked at my episode before, but I didn't want this to, to – uh, uh, I didn't want it to persuade me to do something different. But I look at Alabama State – Last week, they had a limited plan for D. Davis. But the way I wanted to say it was specified or specialized, right? Because that's what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to say, all right, our quarterback struggles are doing this, this, and this. We need to make sure that we build around him. And I'm not trying to put everything on D. Davis. I think that would be unfair. But my problem with them is, and I said then, the effectiveness of this plan is going to be, or the yeah, the effectiveness of this plan is going to be decided by how much success that it gets. My biggest problem for them is no matter how good the game plan is, Alabama State has not proven themselves to consistently be able to score 21 points. If I have a defense that is an elite defense and occasionally lets up 21 points, let's, as an offense, let's bail them out because they've bailed us out continuously. And it's not like 21 is a lot of points. But the problem is Alabama State is a team that you want to believe in because they have a great defense. You trust in their defense. But the problem why I don't consider them championship contenders coming into the season is that they have an offense that is shaky, and I don't trust them to score 21 points. They scored 14 and 17 in the first two weeks of the season. And now your defense allows 21 points, and you lose. Every time Alabama State's defense allows 21 points, it should not be a loss for the Hornets. That is an indictment on the offense. The offense has to be better. And until they prove that they can consistently be better, I'm going to continue to have these concerns about Alabama State. That's why I will always be hesitant to put them into the championship contender category because I don't know how complete they are on both sides of the ball. How can I trust in that? How can you trust in that? That's the problem. I don't care how good that secondary is. I don't care how much you love Bubba Adams. I don't care. Because the offense isn't inconsistent. They are who they are. Denny Green, they are who we thought they were. That's who, that's who they are. They're an offense that does not score points right now. And until they find that ability, where do we place them? Until they find the ability to consistently score points, where do we put them? Right? Because I, I, I try not to do this when it was Southern. Because Southern has what I believe to be a strong defense. Now, that being said, Jackson State did what they needed to do on Saturday. Shout out to them. We'll discuss them tomorrow. Probably not their offense, but we'll probably uh, discuss Jackson State in general tomorrow and their defensive line. But I'm like, okay, Southern has a solid secondary. I understand, especially when you're running certain plays. I get it. I'm not on the bandwagon, though, because it's only 14 points. You got to show me a little bit more. And maybe I, I think where I did mess up. Why? One second. False alarm. Nope. Excuse me. <laughs> but 
Where I did mess up is I started talking about D. Davis making throws when he needed to and how that could elevate the offense. I should have required a baseline of points to be scored before I started discussing elevating the offense. That's me. That was a bit premature, and I might have gotten people a little bit too excited. But outside of that, I had my questions, and I had my reservations, and I feel like I remained hesitant within my, my commentary. You know? And this isn't me saying, yeah, they'll never be this, but they have to find it. If North Carolina a t can hear my wrath about how they need to find a quarterback in order to have a successful offense, then I'm going to say that Alabama State needs to find a success or needs to find a successful offense in order to build a championship contender. It's all even across the board. I'm always going to be fair. I know some people like to think I play my favorites and whatnot. That's not really true. Honestly, I'm just going to be real. That's not really true. I don't really... To be honest with you, I know I, I only really care about one of these schools that we discuss. Like, let's just be real. It's Texas Southern. I hate that I'm not in my home studio to show the flag off. But outside of that, you know, I really don't care about your school. I don't. Not in a way to be slanted about them. I hope that you all succeed. You can't all succeed. And maybe a little bit of Mississippi Valley. I've realized that this is something I realized about myself. Is because we used to beat Mississippi Valley State back in the day. The idea of being connected to Mississippi Valley, or just even my view of Mississippi Valley State, is really different. I noticed that about myself. Um, somebody left a comment like, oh, DG don't want to be, D talking about me, of course, but uh, doesn't want to have any ties to Mississippi Valley State. And it was just like, wow, why was, I, why was I so appalled at the idea of Mason saying that I was from Mississippi Valley State? Like, it's just little stuff like that. Little stuff like that, I start to realize, like, dang, maybe I low-key do have a problem with this school. But... Outside of really my school, I don't care about your school like that. I have no biases towards your school. I don't love any of your schools. I don't hate any of your schools. Your schools are just there for me to discuss objectively. Like, unless you play, even when you're playing us, I'm going I'm to call it how it is. I'm going to call it how it is. Anyway, that being said, I don't care who the quarterback is because I'm about to make this into a tangent about me. I don't care who the quarterback is. For Alabama State. I don't care if you decide to keep going with D. Davis. I don't care if you decide to get Damon Stewart in. I do not care. But if you are going to be a championship contender, then you need to build an offense that I do not feel is consistently set up to fail their defense. I'm, I'm not saying that they're set up to fail, but the way that they operate, the amount of points that they've scared, scored over the last two years, it tells me that they aren't set up to capitalize off the off the defense they have they rely on the defense you should be you should build an offense that can score 22 points because you have a defense that you feel can consistently hold people under 21 simple and plain if you are Alabama State you should be trying to build an offense that scores 22 points because you have a defense that consistently keeps people under 21 and there's no reason that you should lose multiple games in which the defense does not allow 21 points and that's my problem with Alabama State is that they don't have an offense that is built to score 22. And moving forward, I have a potential elite level deep threat. Dante Lee Jr., wide receiver for Shaw. He's been arguably the only bright spot for that Shaw passing game, but he's been a really bright spot that we'll look into as we continue with Locked On HBCU. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, and FanDuel is the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. If you're new to the game, right, and you're just putting down your first bet, put $5 in. Win or lose, doesn't matter. You get $200 back in bonus bets. If you, if you aren't new, put $5 down, and you'll get $100 off of the Sunday ticket. Now on YouTube TV, great. They have the multi-view. Shout out to them. But enough of them because they ain't paying me. They ain't cutting no checks. But that being said, get the Sunday ticket. Watch every single game. And then you can actually put some money down because you know what you're watching. It all comes full circle. It all comes full circle. So put $5 down and receive your gift back, whether you're a new customer or a returning customer. All you have to do is go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to make every moment more as we're wrapping up today's episode of locked on hbcu thank you for making this your first listen of the day every day all the way to segment three and i thank you two times for that i am 
a real disgrace for not mentioning how my Saints won. You should have put some money down on New Orleans when I was having my fan duel read. But it's okay because I'm going to make time. Real fans make time. And I had to make a little bit of time to look into this Dante Lee Jr. guy because I truly do believe that he has all of the makings of being an elite deep ball threat. A wide receiver for Shaw University. Now, listen, I understand that Shaw is currently 0-2. I understand that Shaw has not had the best luck when it comes to passing the ball this year. They haven't been that good at it. But one of the guys who has been good is Dante Lee Jr. And it's not just that sometimes a guy who is average height looks tall around short people. That's not what's happening with Dante Lee Jr. It's not that he's the only person who is producing in the wide receiver room, so now he looks better. It's just, we're going to discuss the impact that he has on the team. We're going to discuss the overall yardage that he's gained on the team. But please remember that the focus is the fact that he is an elite deep ball threat. And we'll get back to that, but we first need to explain how that skill set has been impactful or what impact that has had. Because some people just... I don't like to only look at wins and losses. That's not fair. There's so much. That's that's just black and white, right? That's just black and white, but there's so much more to the story of every game. That's why looking at a box score isn't always fair, you know? But when you look at what Dante Lee Jr. has been able to do and allow me to separate the player from the team, in week one, he had 72 of the Shaw's 98 yards passing. So over two-thirds of the yardage, nearly three-fourths of the yardage, right? You're looking at week two, 84 of the 203 yards. Now, that's a better ratio as far as the team goes. Lesser percentage of the yardage that he has, okay, but still 84 yards. What is most, and he was the leading receiver by far on both games. What's the most impressive by this, about this, excuse me, is the fact that he did it on four catches, two catches in week one, Two catches in week two. And actually, his second catch was a negative one-yard pass. So he actually lost a little bit of yardage. And he still averages nearly 40 yards a pop through the air. Like, this guy has been remarkable in these first two weeks. So I'll tell you how I was able to see him in week two. Because in week one, he had a 66-yard uh, reception. In week two, he had an 85-yard reception. The second one went for a touchdown. That's the first play I saw. I clipped over. I'm not going to lie to you. I had a real packed Saturday. Like, my Saturday was full. So I wasn't able to just watch all the games all the time. I had to bounce around. Like I don't think this was a greatly scheduled week. It's just so many games were at 6 p.m. This wasn't one of them, so I was able to just kind of click over. But even then, I was doing a lot of stuff. So I clipped over or clicked over. Boom. Deep ball. I'm seeing the replay. <laughs> Boom. I'm like, okay, I see Shaw. Game was close. I think they might have brought it within about seven points or something of, something like that. So, and then halftime comes up. I clip away because like, I'm, I'm watching something, doing stuff, right? I click back over. Oh, Shaw streaking. I don't even know what the score is, but I see Shaw streaking down the field on what looks like a kickoff return. I wasn't sure if it was kickoff or if it was punt. I wasn't sure. I click mid-play. So, now I'm like, okay, this dude is streaking past, past one player. He's past the uh, the kicker. This dude got some, some jets on him. I look up, it's Dante Lee Jr. So these two plays build up the fundamental on why I believe he has the makings of an elite deep ball threat. So first off, we've seen a 66-yard catch. We've seen an 85-yard catch. And I've seen a touchdown through, uh, uh, through kickoff return. 250-plus yard, 260-plus yard catches. One was a touch. He has all the touchdowns for Shaw University this year. They've only scored 13 points. And he had the touchdown on that 85-yard catch. And he had the touchdown on that kickoff return, which was a school record, by the way. The reason I feel like these are makings of a great deep ball threat, or he's really just an explosive player, is we've already seen him go down the field. But then also he has the ability to make plays with ball in his hand because he's a kickoff return artist. And those guys know what to do when they have open field. I wasn't able to see a whole lot of Dante Lee Jr. He only had two catches in that game. And he had a monster kickoff return. But I've seen enough to know that he has the makings of it. 
He's averaging nearly 40 yards per catch. I don't need to go look at who else is in the in the CIAA right now. I don't. I can guarantee you that that is the highest yards per catch in the conference. He's been extremely impactful, and he's been the only person who's been consistent for Shaw University's passing game. Of course, you're going to need more than just him, but he's been impressive, and he's looking like a potential elite deep threat in the conference this year. We'll watch to see how much that can continue. Maybe he averages about 20 a pop. Maybe that's what he does, but we'll see, and you'll be here to watch it as well. So I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day. Every day on tomorrow's episode, we'll be discussing Jackson State's defensive line because I think that that's going to be the unit for them that really stands out more so than anybody else. So we'll look at that on tomorrow's episode, but in the meantime, in between time, if you're looking for me, you can find me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Until the next time that we hear each other family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.